Marcheseau left circle to the high slot Petrangelo. Marcheseau, he scores! Marcheseau wins it in overtime! Letang to the front off the skate, score! That's gonna count and it's gonna belong to Jeff Carter. It sure is. Jailbreak, two on one, to bring it for the front. Doc delays, there's to bring it. What a save! My goodness, what a stop by Spencer Knight. And then look, he flashes a smile. Hey everybody, welcome into another episode of Our Line Starts, fueled by Duncan. I am fueled today by Anson Carter and Dominic Moore. What's happening, guys? Hey, KT, Ace, how you doing? Good, good. KT, how was your little vacation? You get a little sun? I mean, it wasn't bad, I will let you know that. Um, yes, I had a nice little vacay to get some vitamin D and recharge my batteries after a very long week. It was great. Yeah, it was, uh, no complaints here. All right, so Dom, give <laughs> Don was on vacation before that. He passed along any tips, or is he selfish? Yeah. <laughs> we were on opposite, I think we were on opposite coasts, so there were not many. Uh, yeah, he just told me to enjoy myself and uh, relax, which I unlike I some I of us yeah. who who live down south all year long, Ace. So only some <laughs> of us could just just steal down there here and there. Hey, we take it for granted, I guess. Whatever, sunshine, no big deal outside. No, yeah, no big deal. <laughs> Well, hey, we are now all back. We're actually doing this podcast together in studio as we get prepared to do a Golden Knights game tonight as we record this. And guys, let's start with that because this Golden Knights team is really becoming the water cooler chat. I was literally getting a coffee five minutes ago at the NBC um, coffee pod break spot, whatever you call it. And people were asking if the Vegas Golden Knights, if it's true that they should bet on this team to win the Stanley Cup. So I guess, let me start there. They're nine and one in their last 10 games. They look like they're completely unstoppable. Is this now the clear cut favorite to win the Stanley Cup? Dom, you're grinning. I'm going to go with you first. <laughs> well, they're certainly playing their best hockey at the right time. I'm always a big believer that you want to peak, you know, as you head into the playoffs, there's been a lot of teams that have had ups and downs throughout the years. Uh, throughout this year, every se- every team in the league has had a down stretch at one point or another. You just want to be able to find your game leading into playoffs, and that's exactly what Vegas has done. Um, obviously, their goaltending is you know where their team starts and ends, and I think they've got that one-two punch that is at the very, very top in the league. Um, when I compare them to Colorado, because obviously in their division, that, that's who they're judged by right now. I feel like Colorado has a better lineup top to bottom. And Ace, you can disagree with me if you want, but I feel like Colorado has more depth, not only up front, but on the, on the defensive side, but it's that goaltending, which Vegas has a huge advantage. And in a seven game series, I feel like the goaltending is such a difference maker. And that, that to me is what would get them through. And then once you're in the conference finals, um, you know, anything can happen from there. Yeah, I wasn't at the coffee cooler there, KT. I was at the tea cooler. <laughs> They're having a couple of sips of people having the same conversation. But I think I'd agree with Dom to a certain extent with Vegas being the favorite because I do like their goaltending. Mark Andre Fleury this year is the guy. It's not Robin Leonard. It's Robin Leonard's team, I thought, last year. This year, I think it's Mark Andre Fleury's team. The team plays a lot better, has been playing a lot better with him being in then. He's been healthy too. The difference with Vegas this year is they have Petrangelo on that back end. So Petrangelo and Shea Theodore have that one-two punch. Vegas has no problems getting a lot of pressure on teams. Now, we saw last year they pressured even Dallas. So many chances they couldn't score. I like the offense from Colorado, but I'm just not sure about their goaltending and their size in the back end. The teams that have had success in the postseason have those long defenders in the back end that take away a lot, a lot of time and space. The long sticks are physical. Colorado defends a different way. They don't have Eric Johnson in the lineup, so they have speedy guys. They, de- they defend with more speed than size. So whatever it comes down to, it'll be an interesting matchup. But at this point right now, I agree with you, Dom. I think Colorado gets the edge. But if – I mean, sorry, Vegas gets the edge. But if the abs get rolling, things could tilt the other way. So I'm where I'm what? usually located on the fence. Uh, yeah, the one thing about Vegas, too, if we're throwing some doubt into that conversation, KT, is that they're really strong off the rush. They're one of the top rush teams and Peter DeBoer has spoken, you know, publicly about this, Mm -hmm. that they want, they need to get better at those grinding goals. And to me, the playoffs, you're not going to see as many of those rush opportunities. You're going to have to score those gritty kind of like garbage down by the goal line goals. And so 
that's something to watch for in the playoffs. I look at a team like Minnesota, they, they know how to grind. And so in a playoff situation, we'll see how this all plays out. Dom, you know, getting back on what Ace said, you know, do you agree that this is now Flurry's net? I mean, you look at you look at the argument, it's it's a tough one to have, a nice luxury to have two goalies if you're the head coach and you're his teammates. But do you agree with Anson in the sense that, you know, it's Flurry's net? I agree with Ace, but honestly, I don't think this is much of a debate because all it means is that he's going to start game one. And the minute if if they lose two games or whatever, it's Leonard's net. And if Leonard keeps winning, he'll stay in net. They have got such good goaltending in both of those guys. I think all that means is that Fleury will probably get the call in game one. He has the experience. He's had a career year. Um, but having said that, you know, if things don't go the way they 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 meant to off the start, it's going to be Leonard, and and then they'll just go with whoever's winning after that. All right, let's shift our attention to the East for a minute, guys, and I want to talk about the race for first place in the East. Taking a look at the odds powered by Points Bet Sportsbook, our dear friends that have put these odds together, and the odds to win the Stanley Cup of the East Division teams: Boston at plus eleven hundred, followed by Pittsburgh, Washington, the Islanders at plus seventeen hundred. Of course, the Isles just most recently of that group becoming the first team to punch their ticket behind Pittsburgh and Washington. Uh, you look at this. And the odds makers, and these guys are usually pretty spot on. Who has the best chance to win the Stanley Cup from this East Division? Ace, start us off. Well, we're talking odds makers. Uh, look at look at KT. This is what we're talking about. <laughs> Where's Eddie out? We need our guy. <laughs> I thought I'd slide that in there. You guys are back. You guys are paying attention. <laughs> Shout out to my guy, Edzo, when it comes to the odds. But I think Pittsburgh is the team that I would put my money down if I'm wearing my Edzo hat. I put my money down the Pittsburgh Penguins. Just the way they're defending right now, I think Crosby's line is the best line in hockey with the way they defend 200 feet, feet on the ice. They shut down the perfection line, which never really happens during the course of the regular season. And they're playoff tested. They get a nice core. And having Jeff Carter add size down the middle for them, when the, if Genny Malkin comes back, you've got Crosby, Malkin, and Jeff Carter down the middle. So I'm not as concerned about their goaltending, Christian Jari and Casey Smith, as I was at the start of the regular season, because they're defending in five-man units a lot better than they were to start the regular season. Yeah, for me, I think it's Boston. You know, I think we were talking about Vegas peaking at the right time, different teams struggling throughout, you know, different stretches of the season. Boston's another team. They went through a bit of a lull. Tuka Rask was out for the longest you know, time he was out in his whole career, and now he's coming back. He's looking really good. They've got Jeremy Swayman backing him up, who's a very solid one-two punch there. Boston's eight and two in their last ten, so they're peaking at the right time. They're getting healthy at the right time. I really like Boston's chances, and there's no doubt about the leadership and playoff experience uh, that that team has. And there's other guys on Boston that have been struggling in the regular season, guys like Charlie Coyle come to mind. Jake DeBrusque that could have breakout playoffs because they're they're playoff type players and so I think you know obviously their additions Mike Riley Taylor Hall they're they're a team that is a different team than a month ago uh, and definitely one that you know keep an eye on. So is that the team that you would least like to play if you're in this East Division you finish in the top four you enter the playoffs I mean is Boston the team that scares you the most? I think so I mean to me they've got every position covered. I mean, Tuka Rask at the top of his game is the, one of the best in the world. And he can carry a team on his back as he did in 2019 to game seven of the Stanley Cup final. Uh, I would have said a month ago, the Islanders were the team that you wouldn't want to face just because Barry Trotz's teams are so stingy. They play a playoff style game, but they've struggled to score goals as of late. That's got me a little bit worried for Islanders fans in that respect. They did though have two really strong playoff style shutouts against the hungry Rangers team. So that, that bodes well for them going forward. Yeah, I would say, I would say the Islanders and just to your point, Dom about um, the Boston Bruins here, you mentioned how you have to grind the postseason. That's the one reason I don't like the Boston Bruins. Their D is like really small. You know, you have, they lost Tory Krug, they lost big Z and they replaced Krug with a couple other Krug like players. They're missing Brandon Carlo. That's why I think they're missing the back end to help shut things down, break those cycles, get the puck out of the zone. But I would hate to play the New York Islanders 
They play a suffocating style, a frustrating style. They have that fourth line that grinds you, that beats you up, that's physical, that's in your face. J.G. Pajot plays the same exact way. Palmieri can play a physical style brand of hockey when he's on his game also. The, the question is whether or not they could score. And Bovilli now is scoring, which is great. Having Josh Bailey back is massive for them. You have to find a way to shut down uh, Matt Barzell. But they're the one team I wouldn't want to play against because you have to go into every single game with that mindset. You have to win that game one nothing, And not too many teams could be that disciplined for 60 minutes. All right. Interesting. Well, to be determined, we'll wait and see the playoffs <laughs> beginning in about, you know, a week from now, a week and a half from us recording this, this podcast. Um, I want to talk about some of the young stars, guys, that have been really electrifying and fun to see. We saw Cole Caulfield, Cole Caulfield, sorry, excuse me, scored his first career goal Saturday night in overtime against the Sens. Spencer Knight, 3-0 and in three appearances this season. You know, how much of a spark can players like that, you know, with Caulfield, you're talking about a kid who's coming out of college, you know, wins the Hobie Baker, transitions in, playing in the NHL. There's got to be, we, we've seen it before with like Kale McCarr and some of these young stars. How much can they really spark their team and maybe get them to a different level heading into this crucial time in the season? I'm, I'm really excited about Spencer Knight. I mean, I think they brought in Spencer Knight with an eye for kind of like McCarr, get him, get his feet wet, let him see, you know, what the, what the environment is like, let him know some of the guys and practice and you know see the NHL environment and kind of build that for next year but he's come in and he's he's in the conversation to start for them in the playoffs and you know I called one of their games last week and he was absolutely phenomenal so calm and poised he's been really impressive to Mm -hmm. me and and you read kind of some of his things that he's is made about his mentality and the way he approaches the game I'm a huge fan of Spencer Knight and would love nothing more than to see him get in some playoff action. And that can definitely spark a team. You know, you got a rookie goaltender coming in there. Uh, that could be a really special story to follow. Uh, Ace for sure. That, that one's exciting. Yeah. Dom, and you may or may not know, but his nanny actually works for a hotel here in Stanford. So she's been talking to me about Spencer Knight for years, how he's coming and she speaks and she has lights up talking about the family and Spencer over the last 18 years. So, When I hear that about a player and how they treat people around them, like the nanny's not in the spotlight. It's not yourself, KT. It's not you, Dom. It's not me. So Spencer Knight doesn't put on a show around his nanny. When I hear that about the player and the family, I want to root for him to do well. And watching him play in the World Juniors this past Christmas time, he started off really slow. That first game was awful for him. A lot of pressure for Team USA. But then he started to build, and then he was unbelievable. You could say, along with Trevor Zegers, they're the two top players for Team USA. So that gave me some insight on how tough this kid was mentally. And then now to walk into a team like Florida that has high expectations. I mean, I'd rather walk into Florida this year than last year. Now Coach Q has them playing better defensively. But I've watched him play several times at Boston College too. And I really, I'm going to go on the limb and say he's the real deal. And we've seen young goalies like Carter Hart come to the league and then struggle their second or third years. But there's nothing that I've seen that's shown any red flags when it comes to the way he plays, way he prepares, and expectations are where they should be. He's going to be a bona fide National Hockey League star. I just want to pick up on what Ace was saying and give a shout out to to Arlene, who's the nanny that Ace was mentioning <laughs> at the hotel in Stanford. And as Ace said, they nothing put but amazing things to say. Business they're like. <laughs> <laughs> what a funny, what a funny contact. I mean, of course, you know, he grew up in Darien, Connecticut, not far from where we broadcast our NHL games in the studio where you guys stay when you have to come in and out of town. But I mean, I love when you pick up stories, especially like as a journalist, I'm just a complete, you know, student of the game of journalism, if you will. You guys always talk about students of the game of hockey, but that's where you get some of your best meat and potatoes material, right? You just happen to be <laughs> talking and enjoying wherever you are and you pick up a little bit of information that uh, is always relevant. So that's kind of cool. But uh, Ace, I'm with you. You know, when you get to know the person off the ice and you hear how genuine and awesome and, and amazing they are, um, it's 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 one of the greatest times when you can hear something come full circle and you know that that's a really good player and you root for them, right? You want to root for them and now you want to root for the Florida Panthers and he found himself in a great situation down there. Florida, one of the best teams in the league and they've been fun to watch. I want to get to the cold brew check fueled by Duncan guys and shift our attention to the central for a minute. Nashville and Dallas fighting for that last spot. Ace lead us off. Who gets in? I still think Dallas gets in, but that was a big point. And that goal from Eric Holla was huge. For Nashville. <laughs> the way he got that 
overtime goal, just beating out Jamie Benn and, and John Klingberg there in front of the net. Yes, Dallas got a point out of it, but Nashville got that additional point. I still like Dallas. They're Stanley Cup finalists for a reason. I love the way Jason Robertson's playing. Jamie Benn's playing outstanding hockey. Klingberg's back now. And I don't think there's a problem with their, with their goaltending. So Nashville still makes me a little bit nervous. As well as Saros has been playing, as well as the team's been playing, say, the second half of the regular season, they still make me a little bit nervous. And I really can't push all my chips in if we're still talking about gambling and points when it comes to Nashville Predators, Dom. Yeah, I, I, I'm rooting for Dallas in terms of they've been through a lot this year. I'd love to see them get in. I'd love to see them get get back in a playoff situation. They, What an experience they had. And coming back from two months in the bubble, uh, we can't underestimate how tough that was, was on them to respond this season. I think they're going to come up just a little bit short. All of their games remaining are on the road. I think that poses a big challenge. And Nashville, I think, has a little bit easier remaining schedule. All right, that was the cold brew check fueled by Duncan this season. Be sure to grab a cold brew for game time because where there's hockey, there's Duncan. And where there's hockey, guys, for the last, as long as I can remember, there's been Ryan Miller. So I want to end this podcast with a nod to Ryan Miller, who announced at the end of the season he is going to retire after 18 NHL seasons, Vezina Trophy, uh, USA Championships, and, of course, Olympic appearances. Um, can you guys just sum up, you know, how best you will remember his career, Dom? I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I played briefly with Millsy in Buffalo, and and just the minute you meet him, you see how kind of dedicated and committed he is. He's just like very studious and um, cerebral about his craft, and it's it's seen, you know, it's it's obvious in the way he's played the game for so long. All the little details that he puts into his game to become better and better every year, the success he's had. And when you have the kind of longevity that he's had, it's clear that you've had that kind of mentality, you know, on a daily basis for a long time. So good on him. It's nice that he kind of announced it early so that we can all kind of give him the recognition he deserves. Real recognizes real. And Dom, you went to Harvard and I was looking at the definition of Michigan State, Michigan State Spartan. And it says studious and cerebral. So go green. <laughs> I <laughs> love what you're doing. And he's a Hall of Famer, KT, without a doubt in my mind. He's a Hall of Famer. Number one in wins for U.S. hockey player in net. He has won just about everything. He single-handedly put the country on his back and almost beat Canada in Canada during that memorable Olympics when Sidney Crosby scored that golden goal. Um, you know, we're talking about families and people off the ice. I've known the Miller family forever. They're legendary at, in, at Michigan State in East Lansing. And one of my best friends, Taylor Gemmel and Curtis Gemmel, I played with them. They're three cousins that played with us at State. And we're over at Lyle Miller's house almost every day in the summertime, going swimming, hanging out, you know, chilling. That's their uncle. And I just take shots on Ryan when he was, like, really young. Like, wow. big clumpers from in tight. And this kid never flinched. Never flinched. I was like, geez, first of all, you got to put some meat in your bones. Is this the kid with his <laughs> no that pack? never happened. <laughs> <laughs> that that never happened. As a person, it's been amazing. So there's no debate in my mind. There's some goalies playing right now who I think, oh, are they Hall of Fame? Not quite sure. Ryan Miller, as far as I'm concerned, without a doubt, KT and Dom is a future Hockey Hall of Famer. All right. Special nod to Ryan. We wish. What's that? Any studious and cerebral. Thanks, Dom. <laughs> he will certainly be missed, uh, and he's always been so accommodating as well with us and the media and just trying to get his when, – whenever we need him. I did a great show with he and his wife during the pandemic. Uh, they could not have been more generous with their time, and um, we're going to miss him. So, But we wish him the best of luck. As you both know, there's a whole nother life after you retire from the game, and I'm sure we will uh, be hearing Ryan Miller's name in many other ways moving forward. So, uh, guys, it's been fun, but, hey, we got a show to do tonight, so we better get cracking. Let's go. <laughs> we get more time with each other how fun is that best day <laughs> thanks Abe. thanks dom and for everyone listening thank you for joining us for this episode of our line starts fueled by duncan and we'll see you next time